Hi, my name is Megan Eckstein. I'm the deputy editor of USNI News. And on behalf of the Naval Institute, I'd really like to thank you for joining us today for Defense Forum Washington. It is now my pleasure to introduce the moderator of our next panel discussion, Maintaining Our Current Navy and Building a Larger Future Fleet. Mr. Brian Clark is a senior fellow and director for the Center for Defense Concepts and Technology at the Hudson Institute. Previously at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, Mr. Clark led studies in naval warfare, electromagnetic warfare, precision strike, and air defense. In response to the 2016 National Defense Authorization Act, he led one of three Navy fleet architecture studies that assessed the Navy's future needs and the implications of new technology for the fleet. Prior to joining CSBA in 2013, Brian Clark was a special assistant to the Chief of Naval Operations and the director of his Commander's Action Group, where he helped develop Navy strategy and implement new initiatives in electromagnetic spectrum operations, undersea warfare, expeditionary operations, and personnel and readiness management. Before we kick it over to Mr. Clark, one housekeeping note, we've allotted some time at the end for audience questions and answers, so please use your Q&A engagement tool on the screen to submit your questions, and we'll do our best to address as many of them as possible. Now, please, let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Brian Clark. Uh, thank you, Megan, for that kind introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Brian Clark uh, from the Hudson Institute, and I want to thank you for attending today's webinar. Uh, I'm very excited to be here, and I'm looking forward to the discussion we're going to have with these two great panelists. Uh, before we get started, I want to cover a couple of housekeeping items. Megan just mentioned uh, for the best viewing experience, make sure you look at the handout that's uh, underneath the, the viewing part of your screen. There's some uh, click uh, buttons you can click there to look at that. Also, there's a button to click for Q&A. So when we get to the Q&A portion of the program, which will be the latter half of this discussion, uh, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. So if you have questions, be sure to put them in via that Q&A function. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to introduce our two great panelists. Uh, Admiral Bill Galinas uh, is a native of Delray Beach, Florida. He's a 1983 graduate of the Naval Academy where he received a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering. Uh, he also holds a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering from the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, Admiral Galinas most re recently served as the Program Executive Officer for Ships, one of the five PEOs affili with, affiliated with NAVC that oversee service combatant amphibious ship, expeditionary ship, and ship connector programs. Uh, prior to that, he led the Navy Regional Maintenance uh, Center organization that plans and executes surface ship maintenance at private shipyards uh, and served as the supervisor of shipbuilding at uh, the Gulf Coast uh, and as the amphibious or, trans or amphibious transport dock ship program manager, LPD-17. As NAVC commander, uh, Admiral Galinas oversees a global team responsible for the development, construction, delivery, and maintenance of Navy's ships, submarines, and systems. Uh, he became, became commander of uh, Naval Sea Systems Command earlier this year in June 2020. Uh, also with us is Admiral D. Peters. Uh, Vice Admiral Peters is a native of Louisville, Kentucky, uh, the 1985 graduate of the Naval Academy, where he received, uh, uh, he has also received postgraduate degrees in aeronautical engineering and telecommunications, and is a graduate of the U.S. Naval uh, Test Pilot School. After earning his wings as a Naval Aviator in 1986, he flew the SH-2F uh, sea Sprite in support of multiple detachments deployed to the North Atlantic, Persian Gulf, and Gulf of Mexico, completing anti submarine warfare, surface warfare, and counter narcotics missions, uh, embarked on four different ships classes. He served in numerous acquisition billets, including most recently commander of the Presidential Helicopters Program Office, leading the program through Milestone Being Contract Award for the Engineering and Manufacturing Development Program. Uh, he has more than 3,800 flight hours in fixed wing and rotary wing aircraft. Uh, and Admiral Peters assumed his current duties as Commander of Naval Air Systems Command in May 2018. Uh, so welcome, gentlemen, uh, and thank you for being here. Uh, to go ahead and get started, um, I wanted to kind of uh, set the scene a little bit uh, before we go into a discussion of, of the challenges that you're facing. But the, the panel is, is uh, focused on maintaining their current fleet and then building a larger fleet. Uh, and that challenge of balancing the efforts <clears throat> to uh, sustain today's ships and aircraft while uh, developing the next generation of those platforms is going to be significant. Uh, the Navy is operating at a pretty high op tempo today uh, due to resurgent great powers such as Russia and China and ongoing threats from countries like Iran and North Korea, in addition to uh, criminal and, and terrorist threats uh, worldwide. Uh, that hot tempo is going to be difficult to sustain in a situation where we have COVID-19 uh, continuing. Uh, we have an aging fleet. Uh, and those readiness challenges are being exhibited by some of the recent challenge or recent problems we've had, such as the Bonhomme Richard, 
uh, such as the LCS's problems, uh, aircraft uh, readiness uh, shortfalls, and also carrier fleet shortfalls. So the, the, the challenges the fleet are facing uh, are starting to evidence themselves in uh, problems in getting the fleet out to, to maintain our current level of off-tempo. Uh, at the same time, we're trying to introduce a new, new uh, generation of technologies in platforms uh, that are going to be both uh, manned and unmanned. Uh, and incorporating those technologies and getting them up to a point of maturity where they can reliably deploy in support of the new operational concepts the CNO and Commandant described earlier today is going to be one of the uh, major tasks I envision that you, you both gentlemen are going to have going forward. So uh, to kind of start with, um, I'll ask a question of both of you, which is how are you balancing these competing demands of sustaining today's fleet um, in, in the face of a very high and, and aggressive op tempo, while also preparing for the future and incorporating new technologies into the next generation of platforms. Uh, Admiral Glenis, let's start with you. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Thanks for that question, and uh, thanks for the great introduction. And a, a shout out to the uh, Naval Institute for hosting this uh, forum this morning, allowing us to do that. So uh, let me tell you what kind of what we're doing. Um, I think you hit on a couple of key points there. Uh, you know, executing the, the maintenance requirements that we have today, today, but really the key word going forward is capacity and, uh, and you know, increasing our capacity, building additional capacity, both in the public and the, and the private sector. So um, uh, let me start with that part of it, you know, kind of what we're doing right now on the capacity piece. And, uh, you know, in the, in the public sector, we've got a couple of things that are going on that we're, that we're working on right now. The first is our, uh, our PSYOP, our, our, our shipyard uh, uh, optimization program, uh, which really is kind of a long-term effort, uh, you know, to, to get after uh, kind of rebuilding in some cases uh, the infrastructure within the shipyards. But um, there, there's two pieces of that I want to talk about just real quickly. Um, you know, the, the first is the optimization part of that. And what we're doing is actually building a digital twin for each one of the four shipyards. We've completed that effort in Pearl. Um, and we've got uh, th that effort ongoing in the other three shipyards. And what that really does is it takes a holistic look at the shipyard and, um, you know, kind of looks at material flow, uh, workflow through the shipyard and, and how we can improve that, you know. And, uh, you know, we're seeing opportunities to, uh, you know, to increase that efficiency factor uh, on the order of 20 percent or more in, in some areas. So, so we think that's going to be a key part of it. That's going to then inform you know, some of the construction work uh, that we do within the yards, okay? Uh, that, that'll that come a little bit later. In the near term on the construction side, which is the second part of the SIA piece I want to talk about, uh, what we're really getting after first is our dry dock capacity. And as you know, in, the, in this audience for sure, um, is, you know, the, the infrastructure within our public shipyards is, is aging. And uh, it's been around for a long period of time. And, uh, you know, we, we've got to recapitalize that, that effort. And, and the first thing that we're going after um, is really the uh, uh, again the the the, uh, the docks and there's a there's a significant project in place right now up in Portsmouth and then uh, we'll follow with Pearl and uh, and Puget Sound um, so that's the PSYOP piece the the second part is uh, again focused more on the on the private sector is we're, we're taking a look at kind of submarine maintenance going out almost 15 years and. Uh, you know what is that? What does that workload look like? Not just today, but in the future. And and what I will tell you is, you know, uh, given you know the current throughput through our public shipyards, uh, you know, we really do see a need to bring private industry into into the submarine uh, repair business. And, and we're doing that now. We're working closely with our two new construction submarine builders at uh, Newport News and up at uh, Electric Boat. Uh, as uh, this audience knows, we've got three submarines. Uh, you know, really in, in, in process, uh, you know, with, with Newport News, working on them. You know, they've been out of the submarine maintenance business for a while, right? So we're, we're bringing them back in. And, you know, one of the things that we're learning uh, is just how complex this business really is. And when you kind of, you know, atrophy or, or divest of that capability, you know, it, it takes time to, to rebuild that. It's not like just turning the light switch on and, and you restart that, that type of effort. So we've got some, some work to do there, and, but we're, we're, making, uh, we're making good progress. The, the other thing um, that I'll talk about just real quick, now this is on the private sector side, um, is an effort that we've really, I think, matured over the last couple of years working with industry uh, is to provide them a, a fairly consistent look at the future workload that's coming down 
uh, you know, down the highway, so to speak, for them in terms of ship repair. And, uh, you know, we meet uh, every other month with them to provide them, you know, our projected workload uh, so that they have an opportunity to kind of forecast out what they, uh, you know, the different projects that they would be interested in, in bidding on. And, uh, you know, we've been able to, like I said, refine that process uh, significantly over the last couple of years. Because one thing that we've learned, at least uh, on, on our side, is, uh, you know, that stable and predictable workload and providing that that uh, insight uh, to industry is, is important. Um, so that's, uh, that, that's a couple. And then the last thing I'll, I'll touch on real quick, and again, this goes across both the public and the private sector, is our, is our planning ability, okay? And, and this now, this kind of gets to, you know, current execution, um, but it also kind of looks a little bit further into the future when we start talking about class maintenance plans for different ships and how those kind of evolve, especially as the ships age. And, you know, maybe there's different maintenance strategies that we want to take on as a, as a class ages and whatnot. So, um, and that's going on across all three of our, our platforms, surface ships, aircraft carriers, and, and submarines. So just a couple of things, uh, you know, to kind of start the conversation in terms of what we're doing, both in the public and the private sector, near term and long term to uh, build maintenance capacity. Back to you, sir. Thanks, Admiral. Uh, that, those are great points, and we'll touch on some of that later. Um, Admiral Peters? Hey, thanks very much. Uh, I want to also say uh, thank you to the Naval Institute, and uh, just uh, really appreciate the opportunity to participate. Uh, I've had the pleasure, of course, of being on a panel uh, last March with uh, Brian, and I can tell you that uh, he always brings out some great questions and then provides some great commentary and ties it all together. Uh, I also want to say that, you know, uh, just by way of lead in that, you know, most of my answers are going to come from the systems command perspective, uh, especially the, the Naval Air Systems Command. Uh, but that's just one piece of, you know, a broader enterprise, you know, the Naval Aviation Enterprise, the NAE, is really led by the Air Boss, Vice Admiral Weitzel, and Lieutenant General uh, Wise. And uh, Nav Air is a supporting role in, in, in terms of what happens on, uh, within the NAE. And uh, so everything that I talk about really is done in conjunction with the Air Boss and with DCA. So as we talk about uh, balancing competing demands to support today's fleet while also preparing for the future, uh, I'm just going to tell you that you know, it's, I think it's pretty obvious, but we have to do both. Uh, and uh, you, even as we were starting on readiness recovery a couple of years ago, there was already this recognition that, you know, we, we can't shovel everything into the readiness bucket. We need to continue to mature technology. Uh, this is kind of a timely topic. Uh, you know, just had the air boss here this morning. So he's on the uh, East Coast and uh you know, had just a quick opportunity to come down and make it an early morning, and we were able to dis discuss some things and drive around Pax River, and had my chief engineer, who's also the Warfare Center commander, uh, talk him through what's going on on the base, uh, you know, in support of really generating that uh, cutting edge technology, maturing that cutting edge technology. All of this is done, of course, in program offices and PEOs. They have cradle to grave responsibility. And then our warfare centers, they will, uh, you know, if, for promising technologies, uh, they'll go after that and they'll incubate it so that then the program offices can take, take it over and they can, uh, you know, send it out to industry uh, for production and for fielding. Uh, and, when you talk about balancing that, it, it really becomes a competition for resources. And that competition, of course, is, you know, where we put our dollars, it's where we put our engineers, it's where we put our logisticians. Uh, this gives me an opportunity to talk about what we've done at NAVAIR. I think it's a good news story. Uh, it's, it's occurred over the last couple of years. But we've really restructured the entire organization to a mission aligned organization. Uh, we were previously set up as a functional organization. Uh, and there was a lot of reasons why that occurred. We operated under that model for 26 years. It was really, uh, it generated uh, as a result of the BRACs that occurred uh, in the 90s. 
And we wanted to retain the talent that we had. And we, we really established the Naval Air Systems Command as a functional uh, aligned organization. And we were able to preserve, uh, you know, our technical talent. And it was, a, it was a good thing from that perspective. But, you know, it, although it served its purpose, uh, you know, we, it really was not where we need to go in the future uh, when we're talking about speed and we're talking about readiness and being able to respond quickly and in an agile manner. Uh, a lot of the things that you do in a functionally aligned organization are institutional. Uh, you, uh, and you're very focused on maintaining the sanctity of your technical responsibilities. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily translate into being able to maneuver quickly uh, to rebalance, uh, to attack problems like physiological episodes or to uh, shift your electrical engineers to cybersecurity or to network engineering. Uh, and uh, over the, the course of two years, uh, we've been able to do that at NAVAIR. And that's going to allow us to be more productive with the resources that we have so that we can do both. Uh, we've had a very significant and a very deliberate uh, pivot towards readiness. I think that's an area that uh, we lost focus on as uh, resources did become constrained. Uh, and, and we had to, to recultivate uh, this sense of the health of naval aviation. Uh, and we've done that uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, we're not where we need to be by any measure. Uh, and uh, we do still have some challenges, but uh, over the course of fiscal year 18 and fiscal year 19, uh, well, I should say starting, starting at the beginning of fiscal year 19 and ending at uh, the end of fiscal year 20, uh, we really uh, increased the mission capability of our platforms dramatically. Uh, you know, if I could just, if you'll bear with me, I'll give you just a few statistics here. Uh, but uh, we, uh, at the end of fiscal year 20, we had 300 more mission capable aircraft across naval aviation uh, than when we started in fiscal year 18. Uh, those increases were most dramatic on the Navy side, uh, but we're also making very good improvements on the Marine Corps side also. Uh, you know, the, uh, our Super Hornets, uh, that success story has been in the news. We've been able to bring in, you know, experts from commercial aviation that, that uh, it really helped what we were already starting to do with some aggressive uh, targets for readiness recovery. And you can see that throughout all, uh, every single platform, uh, improvements in uh, mission capable. We do a better job with our heavy depots. We're doing a better job on the O-level side. Our supply and our engineering are more focused where they need to be. Uh, and the overall result has been an increase in mission capable readiness. We're kind of shifting that to lethality. We want to build on that. Uh, we want to make sure that we're uh, getting after all of those mission systems that are critical for the high-end fight. Uh, that's a, you know, a deliberate focus uh, of the Air Boss and of DCA. Uh, and so it's lethality, it's survivability, it's all those things that we need for the high-end fight. Meanwhile, we are maturing those cutting-edge technologies that are warfare centers. All of this, I think, is enabled uh, by the structural changes that we've made, but it's more than that, right? It's, it's our workforce is really dedicated and they're talented. We just got to put them in the environment where, you know, they're, we can cut them loose. And uh, so we've delegated uh, and empowered uh, the workforce. Uh, we've, we've made sure that everyone understood the accountability of where we need to go, both on the side of uh, future technologies and uh, from a readiness standpoint. And that's uh, what's really going to take us forward, uh, in, you know, over the next few years. So I hope that got a little bit at your question, uh, Brian, and I'm more than willing to expand on any of those topics as we go forward. So thank you. You bet. Uh, that did. That did. Thank you very much, Admiral. Um, so a couple of things that you both mentioned uh, were related to how we are best uh, taking advantage of both private and public infrastructure and capabilities to support current readiness. 
Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. You know, Admiral uh, Galinas, uh, you talked about how you're trying to improve the, the stability and reliability of uh, projections for workload for the private shipyards. Um, are there new ways that you're trying to work on contracting them to allow them to uh, maybe build towards the build their infrastructure to support that workload? Um, and then uh, Admiral Peters, are you taking advantage of uh, private uh, uh, industry to support aircraft readiness beyond just what happens at the FRCs? Um, I don't know if you know, to, to what degree you're tapping into, uh, certainly with Boeing doing the slap on the uh, F-18, that's an example of that, but um, how are you both leveraging the private industry component of the uh, defense industrial base? Um, so Admiral uh, Peters, you wanna start? Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, you know, we have a little bit different setup uh, than on the NAVC side and with the shipyards and, uh, you know, ships uh, depot maintenance. Uh, our uh, aircraft depots are, are actually manned by working capital fund employees. And so uh, we have a little bit more flexibility with our working capital fund. We have been able to augment our workforce where needed. Uh, if there are some surges that we need associated with, you know, with this, what the fleet schedule is for uh, getting air wings uh, out the door and carrier strike groups. Uh, so we do leverage uh, industry in that regard. Uh, you know, probably not as much as what uh, Bill talked about uh, with bringing in the, the private sector for uh, completion of what would traditionally be done, uh, you know, for their ship's maintenance. Uh, you did mention uh, um, service life modernization program, uh, which of course is done by industry. And that's a key part of, you know, making sure that we have the strike fighters that we need well into the future. Uh, that program is is really just getting underway. We've we've had you know several aircraft go through uh, this uh, service life modernization program. It also they also come out uh, as Block Three aircraft. Uh, I can tell you what we're learning in that, uh, which is helping us, is that uh, the scope of what we thought that that uh, project was going to be was uh, underestimated. Uh, when we get into the aircraft, we're finding more corrosion than we anticipated. That knowledge helps feedback on what we're doing on our depot side and what we're doing on the O-level side so that uh, we have, that we're attacking uh, corrosion as a systemic degrader across all of our aircraft. Uh, in fact, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're incorporating the latest technologies. We talked about some of the cutting edge technologies and this isn't really the sexy stuff like missiles and rockets, but you know, at our warfare center here at Pax River, we've we've developed several corrosion preventative compounds uh, that are patented and then licensed to industry, and they're producing those uh, corrosion preventative compounds, and we're incorporating those into what we do on the O level side and and in our uh, fleet readiness centers, and that's going to help with what we need uh, industry to do, because really when you bring industry in. Uh, you don't have that same flexibility. You need to be able to scope out what that contract looks like, uh, both from an affordability standpoint and so that you can get your, your steady state throughput going. Uh, so we're, we're going back and making sure that our aircraft are actually ready to go into the service life modernization program. Uh, and that's, so we're still taking advantage of industry, but uh, maybe not to the extent that uh, NAFC is. Ever Glenis? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll start with the uh, on the surface ship side with what we're doing with private industry. And I think as as you and your audience knows, you know that's where we do uh, all of our our surface ship maintenance is, is in the private the private shipyard. So a couple of things that we've done, um, you know, over the last several years, we we have made the transition um, from cost type contracting to fixed type fixed price contracting. Uh, for private sector surface ship availabilities, and uh, you know that was, uh, uh, I'll just say there were some challenges as we made as we made that transition. Um, I think we have come through that. Uh, you know that process in terms of uh, planning and awarding those contracts um, is is working much better now. And, and again, a, a lot of good uh, you know feedback and work with the private shipyards to be able to get to that point. Um, in in doing that. 
Um, again, I, before I reference that, you know, that predictable and stable workload that industry likes is looking for, right? So one of the, the things that we've been able to do is kind of bundle some of these contracts, okay, um, to, uh, to allow us to award a couple of shifts at the same time, you know, even though maybe the work scope isn't, you know, fully defined, um, we've got a construct in place now that allows us to, you know, provide a little bit more workload, a little bit more sustainable workload to a particular shipyard, um, which is, is really always always a good thing, okay? Um, the other effort that, that it, right now we're, we're working, um, you know, our, our goal previously was to try to get these contracts awarded, you know, somewhere, you know, 30 to 60 days before the availability uh, were to start. And what we found is that, you know, that really doesn't give the shipyard time enough to do their detailed production planning, uh, get the material on order, line up the subcontractors that they need, you know, make the requisite uh, preparations within the shipyard to be ready to accept the ship when she comes in. Um, so working with with Navy leadership, with industry, um, you know, we're pulling the award dates back to A minus 120, 120 days or four months before the availability starts. And uh, I think you're really going to see some of that here in uh, in fiscal year 21, as we as we go into that, and uh, and I think that's going also going to make a a big difference in in terms of allowing that that private shipyard when they get that ship when they get that contract, you know, to get all of those items lined up so that when we hit the start date, they're kind of you know running through the starting line if you so to speak instead of you know out of the uh, out of the starting block. So so that's gonna that's gonna make a that's gonna make a big difference. Um, the uh, the other thing, again, and, and I, I'll tell you, we're continuing to work on this, is the concept of unplanned work and, and change once the contract starts. And this, this frankly, goes across both the public and the private sector, but, you know, uh, it, it continues to be, I think, a challenge for us as we as we get ships into unavailability. Um, you know, we find work that, uh, you know, maybe wasn't properly scoped or there's more work than what we anticipated you know, that results in a contract change under the fixed price contract that we're using right now. And our ability to quickly adjudicate that both from a technical and a contracting perspective um, is, is really key. And, you know, we've been able to drive that cycle time down, you know, which in some cases were, were weeks, if you will, you know, down to, to days. And, and so that's that's also made made a, a key difference there. So so those are on the on the private sector surface side, um, you know, some of the things that we're doing on the on the contracting piece. Um, on the uh, on on the submarine side, I think one of the things I mentioned the 15 year submarine maintenance plan that we're that we're working on right now, and what that's really going to do is kind of give us some insight, uh, uh, not just for the work the, the availabilities that we want to kind of contract out to the private sector, but work that we're doing inside of the public shipyards that maybe we want to push that work out to the private sector. Okay, um, and, and so you know things like uh, what we refer to as uh, you know, rotatable pool items or depot level repairs. So these are, you know, fairly complex components. They could be valves, they could be pumps, uh, maybe shafts or something that we repair inside the public shipyards, you know, and, and typically that work goes to some of the shops in the public shipyards that are probably the heaviest loaded, right? And so if we can free up that capacity in those shops and push that work to private industry, um, you know, that gives us more capacity in the public sector and also provides more opportunity for for industry, and so you know we're we're looking at that, and and, and that's another effort I think here in, in uh, fiscal year 21 we'll, we'll kind of really really get after. And then I just I, you know I talked about the availability. So again, part of that 15 year plan is kind of looking at the different types of submarine availabilities and which ones really make sense to kind of push to to to, uh, to private industry, right? So you know if you, if you look at the complexity of a, a, a an overhaul of a nuclear submarine. Um, you know, there's there's some of that work that, quite frankly, is better suited to be done inside the uh, public shipyards where we do have that that capacity, that talent, and maybe there's other work that's better suited for for private industry. So that's part of the kind of the study effort that we're that we're coming through, and, uh, and we're we're making we're making good progress on that. The other <clears throat> the other piece that I would I would offer is, um, and, and this is kind of back on the on the surface side again, um, <clears throat> is is looking at. Uh, you know what other shipyards are out there that that maybe uh, we, you know we could kind of bring into the into the mix, okay, uh, so to speak, in terms of uh, you know providing additional additional capacity. And we've been we've been pretty successful in doing that, uh, you know, on the on the west coast uh, uh, using uh, Vigor uh, International up in the up in the Pacific Northwest, who's, who's done some really really good work for us. 
um, you know, on, on the destroyer, the, the uh, LCS, and, uh, and, and, and now on the cruiser mod program. So, you know, there's an opportunity where we, we brought, you know, another, another company, you know, into our portfolio of shipyards that, that we can work with. We're doing the same thing on the, on the East Coast with a couple of yards in, in the Norfolk area. Um, we've actually we've we've worked with them before, uh, East Coast Repair and Kalanas, who uh, have, have done a lot of work with the Navy, quite frankly. But you know they're expanding their capability, and we're being able to uh, to bring them in as as well. And so again, just kind of expanding that capacity as we as we look to the future, as I, I talked about a little bit earlier. So those are just a couple of things that we're doing, working with the industry to really kind of um, expand our capacity and, and hopefully um, you know make it a little bit. Uh, you know, easier to, to work with with the Navy on. Right. Those are great points. Uh, thank you very much, Admiral. Um, so moving towards it, looking at the future, um, you know, some of the, the recently, some of the technologies or the, the new capabilities that the Navy has been pursuing have, have run into roadblocks that have been presented by Congress in large part because of their concerns about uh, the level of maturity of new technologies, particularly for unmanned systems. Uh, but also we've had challenges uh, over the last decade in terms of maturing the technologies for the LCS mission packages, uh, the concurrency problems with F-35. So, so maturing of technologies prior to construction has been an issue that um, the Navy's had to deal with along with the rest of the joint force. Um, so, uh, so Admiral Galinas, um, how, how are you uh, dealing with that, some of the new generations of technologies that you're maturing now, for example, unmanned surface vessels? Yes, that's a great question. So, so we're doing a lot of prototyping for one. Okay, and uh, you know, we just had a uh, on the on the un, unmanned side, we just had a very successful test uh, where we actually sailed a, a vessel, an unmanned vessel, from the Gulf Coast to the West Coast. Okay, um, essentially, uh, you, you know, with with little to no uh, manned intervention there, and it was a very very successful test. Um, you know, and. Uh, so, so a lot of a lot of prototyping in, in in that area, and you know when we think about the unmanned piece, um, it, it's not so much the uh, I'll, say, I'll use the I'll use the word exquisite, but it, it, it's not so much the the, the cutting edge technology um, as as much as it is driving reliability into the technology that we have today, right? So to to allow us to meet that ASABO, those those extended operations, you know, and that that test that I just talked about, you know. Where we, we drove the vessel from the Gulf Coast to the, to the West Coast really kind of gave us some pretty good insight there, you know, in terms of the reliability of the systems on that particular platform. So, you know, that that's kind of the thing that we're we're doing right now is is the reliability piece, particularly on the on the unmanned side. When it comes to some of the more complex um, uh, platforms, uh, you know, like Columbia, for example, okay, which which you know really. Um, we're doing a lot of, I think, as, as your audience knows, a lot of land-based testing, you know, uh, right now up, up in Philadelphia, for example, at our, at our test facility up there. And, uh, you know, that's going really well. We're essentially building kind of a, you know, a, a, a Columbia class, uh, you know, propulsion plant and drivetrain up there, you know, to really go through and, and ring out the, not just the, the technology for the, the individual components, but it's that, that integration, the integration risk, okay, and, and you know, when you start connecting these large, uh, large components together and operating them as a system, and just th that's an important piece of what we do at these at these land-based test sites. And uh, and so Columbia is really that, that's probably the, the the most the clearest uh, example of, of where we're doing that. You know, another uh, area right now that that's ongoing is on the the uh, uh, the DDG 51 Flight Three. Uh, both the combat systems as well as the, uh, the the new electrical system that we're that we're putting on that ship, right? So, you know, just here a few weeks ago, we we took delivery of the uh, of the the, the first uh, AMDR uh, uh, array up in uh, up in Morristown, you know, and so we we've, we've essentially built now it doesn't have all the, all the, all three arrays, but it does have the uh, um, you know we've got one array with the uh, with the ship's electrical system, right? So we're, we're kind of, that's that's an integration piece, right? We did a lot of testing on the radar. Uh, we've done testing on the electrical system. Now we're, we're bringing those two together and, and doing that that level of integration. And then again, back in Philadelphia, again, on the on the electrical system for the DDG-51, um, that's where we're, we're bringing a lot of these components again, or, or together rather, um, to, to test out and, and go through that, that integration level testing. So. Those are the things, you know, it's, it's prototyping and it's land-based testing, really, that uh, I think are probably the two things that we're doing to, to try to get after that. And, uh, and I think you'll, you'll see more of that as, as, we go, uh, as we go forward, you know, and, and we start looking at, uh, 
you know, newer platforms like like the frigate, we're kind of still working through that plan, um, you know, and how we're going to approach that on that that platform. But that, that's kind of what we're doing in that area. Yep. Thank you, Admiral. Um, that, that certainly makes sense. Uh, Admiral Peters, you've got the MQ25 uh, in development and uh, also an NGAD is beginning uh, a new program to uh, look at a sixth generation type uh, air, cap air capability. I want to say it's a fighter, but it's a, a air capability to replace uh, the FA-18 uh, Super Hornets. Um, how are you pursuing the, the development of those technologies? You talked a little bit earlier about that. How are you addressing these concerns that Congress has raised about having the level of maturity of the underlying technologies before we begin construction of the platforms they're intended to support? Yeah, thank you, Brian. And uh, a lot of what uh, Admiral Galinas mentioned, I think I would have to double tap on that, uh, especially with the prototyping and the land-based testing and the, you know, the reliability focus. Uh, the topic itself is is really broad, and so let me try to cover a couple of branches there. And the, the first one is really with the networks. And um, you know, I was I was really actually hoping that uh, Rare Admiral Small could participate also and talk about what's happening with Project Overmatch. But that's all about strengthening and hardening and integrating our networks. Uh, you mentioned the the unmanned systems that, that we're fielding and that we're going to field. We really rely on those networks. And so the reliability of the networks is key. The security of the networks is very important. Uh, and we've got to get that correct. But it's not just for the unmanned systems. You know, think about naval integrated fire uh, counter air we this has to be integrated uh with the ships we're starting to do that now uh you've seen in the press probably some talk about uh, battle management aids that uh, vice admiral kilby has asked us to develop and that's going to uh integrate you know uh, aegis with cec and our e2s and our strike fighters and so it's it's actually uh a really thrilling time to be working in that area. Uh, as far as the just getting it right first before we deploy it, I mean, we've seen more and more opportunities now than ever to do experimentation, especially with our fleet battle problems and fleet battle exercises. Uh, we've been able to integrate promising new technology and, and really get a look at it in an operational environment. I mean, getting the carrier strike group ready to go on deployment is probably the best place you wanna take a look at some of this promising technology. And then on the individual side, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've really been able to take advantage of some of the newer manufacturing technology to prototype uh, some of these systems. I'll give you one example, you know, from the electronic warfare side, uh, we did an upgrade for ALQ-99, and we were able to additively manufacture the components that were required to upgrade that system for ALQ-99, test it in our own anechoic chamber, put it on the aircraft, fly it, and uh, the fleet battle experiments that are going on. Uh, and it's, it's a success story. Those are small. Uh, it, I think the challenge is how do you integrate those small success stories? You know, what, what's in between there? and the fleet battle experiment, or you talked about the next generation air dominance, how do you incorporate that? Uh, the way we're structuring that program, I think is going to be really focused on maturing technology up front, the, the technology that we know that we need to go further, to go faster, to think faster, to shoot first. Uh, and that's, uh, that's what's going into that, that program office that's, that's just established. It's the program offices that field this equipment and this technology. You know, it's the systems commands that really want to make sure that they have the, the, the prototyping available and that they've, uh, you know, been able to e experiment with it. it. There's an important piece of this here that, that I want to bring out uh, that, that does involve industry, and hopefully uh, the audience will resonate with this, but, uh, you know, we can't get around to all of the companies to talk about how they're spending their internal research and development funds. But if we could, and maybe we use this forum to do that, you know, we want to do exactly what you're talking about is these most promising technologies help, you know, make sure that they are mature, mature those technologies, help us get them to the next level so that they don't die that death that you know, occurs at a technology readiness level of four or five. We need to get it to six or seven so it can be easily integrated into the way we structure our acquisition programs. 
Uh, and, you know, I would ask industry to take a hard look at what are you doing to advance national security through your internal research and development funds, you know, which I consider to be a shared resource, you know, that we help pay for those uh, internal research and development funds. And, and we'd like to also help influence how they get spent. So I think with that, I'll, I'll hold there. Thank you. Uh, that's a great point. Your last point was a very good one, because I hear that from industry a lot, is they're looking for guidance on how to spend their IRAD and um, you know, getting a better, I guess, uh, relationship between the government and industry on how IRAD gets spent would be important to kind of bridge that valley of death. Um, so I'm going to turn to some questions from the audience, uh, which we've got several of. Uh, there's been several questions uh, about one topic in particular, which is COVID-19 and the impact of COVID-19 on supply chains, uh, you know, both OEM supply chains and in general supply chains, uh, considering the reliance on just-in-time supply that we've had in previous years, maybe not so much today. Um, so uh, I'll start with Admiral Galinas. How, is, how has COVID-19 impacted your supply chains um, in terms of you know, ship repair, particularly ex, you know, for expeditionary forces that are out in the field or deployed already? Yeah, no, that, a great question. So um, I would tell you, we, uh, both in the, in the public and the private sector, we have seen impacts, okay? And, uh, uh, but having said that, I would also tell you that, uh, you know, the, the leadership in the shipyards, again, both in the public and the private sector, um, has really done, I think, a, a very, very good job of mitigating those those impacts. And uh, you know, they've they, they've implemented all the uh, the protocols. I'll say that that we've all become familiar with in terms of wearing a mask and you know trying to social distance and whatnot when you can. You can't do that all the time on a ship, obviously, especially when you're going through some of the repair piece. But uh, uh, they have they have done a good a, a pretty good job of that. And you know, it's just um, in terms of the trends. Brian, what I would tell you is just like the, the, the country and even parts of the country, right? So, you know, earlier this summer, uh, coming, you know, right after the 4th of July period, uh, we really saw kind of a, 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 an uptick in the, uh, in the Norfolk and, 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 the, and the San Diego yards in particular, okay? Um, you know, I think we, we kind of held our own out in Pearl and, uh, and up in the Northeast and, uh, and even the Pacific Northwest, quite frankly. Um, but even as of late, you know, and I'll say going back to uh, the early part of November, we're starting to see kind of a, a, a pretty good uptick literally across the enterprise. Okay, so that's all of our yards, both again in the public and the, and the private sector. Um, you know, from a percentage standpoint, uh, you know, we're, we're working, uh, you know, anywhere from I'll say uh, in the low 90s, 92, 93% capacity, uh, you know, down maybe as low as 70%. I'm talking about the production workforce now principally is what we're, what we're focused on. So again, and it, it kind of ebbs and flows. Um, the, the other, but the other piece of this is, is not just, uh, you know, people showing up for work, but, you know, um, when we have to ROM people, right? So, you know, just like, uh, you know, if you come in close contact with, with somebody, you know, you have to kind of self-isolate for 14 days and, and whatnot, you know, those protocols are in place in the shipyard. So that also has an impact. Okay. So, you know, the, the yards really do take this, <clears throat> they've taken this very seriously. Um, and they've done a really good job, I think, of putting the protocols in and trying to manage that. The um, <clears throat> probably our biggest impact though, is when we do get a bloom and it affects a particular, um, you know, trade or a particular work crew um, or a particular group of people that are very critical to, to a, you know, to a, a particular job. We had uh, we had one ship where uh, you know we lost a machinist crew, for example. Okay, down in the machinery space, uh, and that was that happened to be a critical path job, right? So that kind of impacted that that particular job. Th that's probably the the, the toughest uh, kind of impact that we that we deal with. Uh, you know, we've had other times where uh, you know we had a group of supervisors that, that we lost, right? And so. Uh, you know, kind of think of who is it, the, the Denver Broncos last weekend playing without their quarterbacks, right? I mean, it's, it's that, that type of situation, right? So, you know, um, so yes, we are seeing impacts. Um, I, I think in general, we've, we've been able to, uh, we've done a pretty good job mitigating them. They, they have had some impact on, on schedules. Um, you know, we've, we've taken some uh, schedule extensions because of COVID uh, up to now, and, and we're working hard to, to manage our way through that. Um, the one thing we have done on the on the on the public sector side, though, um, is we have activated our surge main reserve workforce. Okay, so this is uh, about 1,350 sailors, reserve sailors that we have 
that do their reserve duty through our four public shipyards. Um, when, when we went into the pandemic back in the, in the spring timeframe, you know, we put in place a plan to activate um, this reserve workforce that we have, and it's about 1,350 sailors that we've mobilized to go into all four of the shipyards. And that really has made a positive difference for us and has really mitigated a lot of the impacts that we probably would have seen from COVID had we not done that. Thank you. Uh, Admiral Peters, uh, how has your supply chains uh, been affected and, and your <clears throat> workforce been affected by COVID? Obviously, the FRCs are probably going to experience this just like the shipyards are. Yeah, a huge topic, Brian. Uh, let me try to make a few points here, and uh, it, it'll be what I think are the, the main points. And one is just the tightness of the relationship with NAVSUP and DLA uh, that we have across the Naval Aviation Enterprise. Uh, just ensuring that we keep very close track of how our supply chains are doing. And I, I think NAFSUP and DLA have done just a fantastic job of staying ahead of this. Uh, we have seen it as an impact uh, uh, at our fleet readiness centers. Uh, we had 22% of our workforce out from kind of the end of March to uh, mid-June, uh, late June timeframe. Uh, luckily, we had just uh, we, we've been concentrating so much on improving uh, the fleet readiness centers that we really had a strong first part of the year, and that helped us get through that and recover. We really had to prioritize uh, what are the next aircraft that we need to get out the door, what are the uh, priority components that need to be reworked, and we've since you know since bringing the workforce back, the full workforce, uh, we really have been able to catch up, and we finished the year ahead of what our projections were for fiscal year 20. So I thought that was a really good news story. We've also been able to use our reserve force and they've been augmenting uh, both at our intermediate level and at our depot level facilities. Uh, let me talk about a little bit, uh, you know, what I think has happened on the acquisition side with uh, Secretary Gertz and his organization have really extended you know, the authorities that we have uh, to provide progress payments to industry, that has allowed our primes to pay their subs in advance uh, and really kept them afloat. Uh, and, you know, as they struggled uh, through this. Uh, and then we've also, you know, looking forward to the future, uh, what this has identified is some, uh, what I would call single point failures. Uh, you know, we had one facility at Santa Clara County, California, which was really the only uh, facility that produced wiring harnesses, both for our rework facilities and for our production lines. And they were hit hard and had to shut down for several weeks. So that was an impact to our production lines and our repair facilities. We know that we need to go in and make sure that we've identified these single point failures. We've established alternate sources so that we can get through this in the future, whether it's COVID or something else. Uh, and then just all of the things that uh, Bill mentioned, you know, we, we're, we're holding on, right? I, uh, the question now is how long can we sustain uh, this? And, uh, you know, so we've done a good job at accommodating it, but we're really looking forward to the future uh, when we can, uh, you know, take what we've learned, but we can get out of some of the restrict restrictive protocols that have kept our folks, you know, uh, from, you know, really uh, optimizing who's in the work centers, who's in our classified spaces, who's in our range control centers, our test squadrons, all that. So, so hopefully that helps. Thank you. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so uh, a couple of questions have related to the next generation of capabilities, uh, and in particular, um, the level of design concurrency, I guess, for lack of a better term, that we're going to uh, accept in the next generation of platforms. So. On the aviation side, we're, we're developing the MQ-25. That's pr a pretty mature design, as I understand it. Um, but we're also pursuing NGAD, um, which will be a sixth generation capability that could be a single aircraft or a multiple aircraft. Um, and then on the, the ship side, we've of course got the frigate. Um, we have um, the uh, next future surface combatant, uh, potentially LX and uh, the next generation logistics ship. So we have a number of new platforms uh, being developed. Uh, the example of the Columbia, you know, of, of being more than 80% design complete before construction, um, you know, suggests that maybe that's a model for the future. For, so for both of the enterprises, uh, to what degree are you looking to uh, improve the design uh, maturity before you begin production of that platform uh, for these new generation of platforms? So Admiral Peters, uh, we can go ahead and start with you since you're on screen. 
Okay. Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, I, I wish I had all of the answers for you on this one. I'm going to admit that uh, we're still uh, searching for how we might do that better. Uh, the CNO has laid down the law, though. He said, okay, we're not going to do another F-35. We, we can't afford to do that with our next generation air dominance platform. We're going to have to figure out how to do this better so that we mature the technology up front. We've got to build that into our budgets. It's got to obviously be supported by both the DOD and by Congress. Uh, but I think if we uh, frame it in the right context, that we will be successful in doing that. Uh, and, you know, uh, that that's going to be critical for, uh, you know, next generation air dominance. It's critical for our unmanned systems, especially. Uh, and, you know, as, as we've seen, uh, you know, the, the concurrency does drive future costs that uh, were not planned for. So, uh that's that's kind of where I'm at there, and uh, happy to expand more if, if I didn't address it. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Admiral Glenis. Yeah, no, I tell you, that's a, that's a great question. And, um, you know, clearly before you start construction, um, you know, 100% of having the design complete would be the goal. Obviously, we don't always get there. Um, but the closer you can get to that 100%, uh, the, the better you are. But the other the other point that I'd, I'd really like to make here is I think um, you know as we go forward and kind of look to, to future platforms, um, take any more I'll say evolutionary approach versus a revolutionary approach. Okay, and you know it, where we have done that, um, frankly, we've been pretty successful. Okay, and on the surface combatant side, um, I'll go back to the uh, you know the transition from the DD. 963 to the CG 47 to the DDG 51, and um, you know just the, uh, the 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 design margins and the and the robustness of the DDG 51 design. I mean, have just they continue to prove themselves out even today, right? As we as we've got uh, you know the first uh, you know three flight three ships under under construction, which right now are our state of the art capability going to the fleet, right? Um, you know where we've kind of taken more of that revolutionary approach. Uh, you know, we, we, we have, in fact, struggled, right, and, uh, you know, with, with, with TDG-1000 and just the number of new uh, elements of that design that, that came into play, everything from the hull form to the propulsion plant to the deck house to the sensor suite to the, to the network, you know, it just goes on, right? Um, you know, I, I, I think in the end, you know, and, and as we did that, quite frankly, the mission requirements changed for that platform, and we're, we're, coming, we're coming through that. And I do think in the end, you know, the, the Navy and the country are going to get, you know, a, a good ship, but it, it's going to come at a cost. So, and let's be, let's be honest. Um, but, uh, you know, taking that, that evolutionary versus revolutionary approach, I think, is, is a key element to, to, to provide a, a good, uh, reliable uh, platform once you get through the design and the construction phase. Um, and then the other thing, as I mentioned before, um, and, and frankly, there's, there's not enough money you know, in the federal budget, quite frankly, to, uh, you know, to be able to prototype and, and test everything. So you, you've got to be, you know, judicious and very selective on where we need to do that. But I think what we're doing, you know, right now, and again, I'll use the DDG-51 as an example where we're, you know, we've done a lot of testing on the radar. Um, we're in the process of doing that integration testing between the radar and the electrical system. We're testing the electrical system on all the, all the new things that are going into the Flight 3s are being tested ashore right now, and I think that's going to pay dividends once we get the ship built and uh, and, and operational. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've had a couple of questions. Uh, we have time for just a couple more questions, but I've had a few questions in the chat uh, related to uh, essentially battle damage and uh, expeditionary repair. So uh, how do we feel about the, how, how confident are we that once we get into a fight, um, because if we get into a fight with a country like China, uh, there will be battle damage. Uh, we will want to not, we will want to return those ships to uh, the fight as soon as possible. Um, how well positioned are we for crews on the ships to be able to conduct their own repairs? Uh, has that, has that degraded over the years? Um, and, and to what degree are we going to be able to do expeditionary repair either using uh, deployed forces and tenders or relying on allies shipyards if we if we looked at allies shipyards as an option for some of these expeditionary repairs so um, for both ships and aircraft how well are we positioned for this kind of fight where we may be uh, needing to do uh, repair work during the course of the battle and uh, return ships and aircraft into the into the fight uh, so Admiral Galenis you want to start yeah I tell you that is a great question and uh, I'll just the, the, the short answer um, 
I'll tell you is I think we've got some work to do in that area, okay? And uh, the, the good news is we are doing that work right now. And, uh, you know, we are looking at what uh, what is our, ex, uh, I'll call it expeditionary ship repair, okay, um, that we would have to, uh, you know, fly away repair teams or, uh, or how we do that. So everything from, uh, you know, from the initial damage control efforts, which I think, quite frankly, uh, uh, you know, the Navy is very good at, okay, uh, today and, and we have uh, you know we've got a number of even recent examples uh, you know uh, where the ship's company the crew has really done you know just a road job of, of in the damage control efforts right and then you transition to the the battle damage assessment piece and what does it take to, to quickly either repair or, uh, or or assess the the damage I think that's the first area we've got some work to do there's a lot of uh, of work going on right now. Um, our fleet commanders, our type commanders, are, are working on improving the self-sufficiency of the uh, of the crews on board the ship. And, and frankly, I think you know one of the positives, if you will, maybe over the last nine months, is that we have seen an increase in self-sufficiency of, of, of ships, where you know we have not been able to on a on a uh, on a regular or very quick basis get technicians out to ships because of the pandemic. Um, so we've we've seen a little bit of an uptick. So that you know that that capability is out there. We just need to foster and build on that. Um, the other thing that's going on right now, uh, you know, the future of sailor maintenance and the and the uh, uh, the Navy uh, you know uh, training program, the NAMPS program um, that provides additional maintenance capability, additional maintenance training um, to our fleet and to our sailors. I think is is also making a making a big difference. So there are programs out there that we're we're building that that piece of it. Um, you know, and then you get kind of to the actual re repair piece, right? And so, um, you know, I, I think this is going to take, uh, you know, in some cases, you know, kind of a, a whole of force or whole of nation effort, if you will, um, you know, and, and it, at least on the on the surface, well, both private and public sector, um, you know, we're going to leverage heavily uh, of, across all of our ship repair capabilities. So, you know, it, it wouldn't, I would see in a in paddle damage, not in common, you know, if we had to bring a, a surface ship into a naval shipyard, for example, right, we could do that, okay. Um, you know, or if we had a flyaway team from, you know, maybe a, a private shipyard to, to help on an aircraft carrier, for example, um, you know, or, you know, uh, just the use of these expeditionary type, type teams. So um, there, there's a lot of work kind of going on in that area, but I would tell you, we still have work to do, Brian. Thank you. Uh, Admiral Peters, uh, how do you feel about that? That our situation there. <laughs> I had a chance to jot down a couple of notes, and of course, uh, Bill used most of my main points. But uh, I want to build on on what he said, uh, especially talking about the tech assist, because you know we do several hundred tech assists just out of Nav Air every year. Uh, everything from uh, shipboard radars to the aviation launch and recovery equipment. And, uh, you know, well, that's one thing that we found during COVID was that, you know, it, it really took us out of the fight. If we had to ROM for 14 days before we got on the ship, we had to, you know, quarantine for 14 days after we came back. And uh, I think it really accentuates what Admiral Grady wants to do with the future of sailor maintenance and increasing the technical skills and the technical proficiency of our sailors. Uh, I'll tell you that I think one of the things that we're doing that's going to enable that is our ready relevant learning program that we're doing for all of sailor uh, training. And that's modernized content, modernized delivery. That's going to allow us to, you know, build on that and increase our technical proficiency so that we're not as dependent on uh, tech reps. Uh, on the kind of the expeditionary repair side, uh, this is an area that we're using our reserves. Uh, the Nav Air Reserve Program has always had a contingency of folks that uh, repaired to go out and do battle damage assessment, especially. And now we're uh, kind of increasing that uh, that focus and that skill set to actually be able to do expeditionary repairs. I talked, I told you earlier about we were using some of our reserves and our uh, intermediate level uh, maintenance and our depot level maintenance. The skills that they gain there are going to be used to provide this capability for expeditionary repair also. So uh, I think we recognize that it's an area that we need to build, but uh, we're well on our way. Thanks. Thanks, Admiral. Um, so we've got time for uh, one more question, I think. And uh, 
So let me uh, step into looking at the future. This morning at the first panel, the CNO and Commandant talked about new operational concepts that the Navy and Marine Corps are pursuing, you know, DMO, EABO, uh, et cetera, looking at new ways to operate in a more distributed manner, um, create challenges for an adversary like China in terms of their own ability to target and engage naval forces. Uh, so th that would imply that there's going to be a, a big increase in the importance of information sharing, information gathering, uh, and decision making uh, in naval operations going forward. So in the in your development of the next generation of systems and in your modernization of existing systems, existing platforms, uh, how much how much are you seeing the increase uh, in the emphasis on uh, information systems? You know, not, IT systems, sensors, decision aids. Have the importance of those systems grown substantially uh, in the last few years as we move towards this more information-centric force uh, that the, the CNO and Commandant described? Uh, so, Admiral Glenis. Um, yeah, Brian, I, I think there is a uh, there's certainly a demand signal out there, um, and I think uh, you know what we're seeing on on the surf on the ships anyway. Um, I'll just say in terms of networks, right, we're continuing to upgrade the networks that we have on board the ship to provide additional bandwidth, you know, uh, the most modern uh, uh, servers and switching mechanisms and things like that. So just, you know, basically at the platform level, um, that's what we're seeing, you know, just kind of a continued, uh, you know, typically any ship that goes through a major CNO availability right now will get an upgrade to its network. So, so there's, there's that piece of it. Um, in terms of, of, of decision making, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, I, I think some of the work that uh, that's being done by by Admiral Small and that war with, uh, uh, with with Project Overmatch, I think that that kind of plays into that going forward. Um, you know, for the, at the plat again at the force and the platform level, um, you know, kind of drawn back here inside the the, the systems command, um, you know, using things like artificial intelligence, and I think we're I tell you, I think we're getting very close now um, to being able to, to in incorporate that capability into some of our decision-making models here within the systems command. Okay, so think about things like you know uh, putting together maintenance packages and predicting maintenance outcomes. Um, you know, how do we develop the workforce and talent management type things? Um, so there's a lot of work going on in that area too to improve that piece. So. Um, Yes. Yeah, so, so to answer your question, we're we're seeing it all the way from the platform level in terms of the work we do during availabilities to what's going on kind of in the future in the R and D world with uh, with Overmatch and and we've got uh, you know folks here at NavC and we work with PEO IWS and again what uh, what Nav War is doing in, in that area and then the artificial intelligence that we're using probably more just on how we execute our business here at the Systems Command. Yep. Uh, Admiral Peters. Okay, thanks. Uh, again, uh, uh, kind of a broad topic, but uh, I'll, I'll kind of approach it the way Emma Galinas did to just start by talking about networks. And uh, one of the key enablers, I think, is uh, TTNT, which is the uh, Tactical Targeting Network. And that provides a much larger bandwidth, and it's going to be able to uh, connect our platforms in a way that we've we've not been able to do with Link 16 and and some of our other um, you know networks. So. Uh, I think that's a that's a huge technology upgrade for us. Uh, let me talk about just the data side of it and the data analytics side of it and how we're using machine learning and artificial intelligence. That's mostly on the readiness side. So uh, I told you we, we 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 brought in some experts from commercial aviation and uh, they've helped us build models to project our readiness and that all uses artificial intelligence and that's how we're really staying ahead of some of the gains that we've made in readiness. Uh, we're also using it, uh, you know, on the supply side uh, to predict, you know, when we're going to have a stock out on a particular component. Uh, we've got a cell down at uh, Orlando at our training systems division uh, that it's a data analytics cell and, you know, they've really attacked physiological episodes, which is a good news story and knock on wood. We're seeing, you know, much, much better uh, performance out of our tactical aircraft and our training aircraft. And a lot of it is associated with using uh, these new data analytics techniques and identifying where the problems are going to be ahead of time and going and preemptively fixing them before they actually do cause a failure and something like a physiological episode. So uh, 
I, uh, you know, I look forward to the future. We have a much more integrated Navy and Marine Corps team. We're sharing at the, uh, you know, on the readiness side, uh, we're integrating them into our operations through the uh, networks piece of it. And I think it's, uh, you know, we've got a good uh, first step associated with this. So thank you. Thanks, Admiral. Uh, yeah, that, that I expected there was going to be an increase both in the use of uh, information and artificial intelligence within the maintenance enterprise, as well as uh, the next generation of platforms are going to incorporate those. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Admiral Galinas uh, and Admiral Peters, for a terrific discussion. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, thank you to our virtual audience for uh, viewing today and participating with a lot of great questions. I, we got to most of them. There are a couple we didn't get to, so hopefully we can uh, somehow come up with a way to, to follow up on those later. Uh, I enjoyed our time together. Thank you very much for being here today.